I'm your host, Rob Carbone. This is BD for Barrett. So shake is big. Down at three. Two hundred ten, episode two ten of the podcast tonight. What's going on, everybody? I am your host R.J. Carbone, and this is another episode of BD Four, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. Hope everybody's having a good night. Um, as I speak, it is one night after the Knicks defeated the Chicago Bulls uh, in the second game of that road trip. Um, so it is a, <clears throat> whoa, as I fucking speak, it is a, um, where are we? Thursday night? Yeah, it's a Thursday night as I speak. Um, so as you're listening to this, it will be Friday morning, February 5th, but right now it's Thursday the 4th. Um, actually watching the Denver Nuggets, Los Angeles Lakers game at the moment. I was, uh, I had a couple down. Dude, I've been fucking killing it on FanDuel lately. Like, and this is not a promotion. I'm not sponsored by them or anything, obviously, you know. But, um, no shit. <laughs> I have, like, two followers. But, no, because I, I, I've been just putting down, I don't know if it's me finally figuring out how to be a competent sports gambler, but... I've, I've kind of switched up my, my little uh, system here. You know, I used to do like a three-leg parlay, but three, you know, big ones with, with um, lower odds. But now I'm being smarter about it, and I'm doing like these like six, seven, eight-leggers, but they're easy, easy ones to get. You know, for instance, like these, these past couple nights, maybe like maybe the past six or seven days... I've been hitting on all these parlays because I'm doing like, for instance, LeBron for three rebounds, Giannis for 16 points, and shit that's pretty much a guarantee, bearing a, a ridiculous off night, and I'm hitting these because I'm doing a lot of those little ones, and it's it's working out so well, and, and knock on wood, but I'm feeling it, and I, so I've got one on this, uh, I've got one, another parlay, another, you know, I think it's like a seven or eight leg around this Denver Los Angeles Lakers game, which is about to head into halftime as I speak. Obviously, as you're listening or watching, it's it, the game's over. But I've got the over under. I've got over on 201 alternate. I've got Denver to, to go plus 25 and a half. So another likely one there. Hopefully, uh, I got LeBron 16 and a half points on the over there. It's another alternate. Got LeBron an alternate three and a half assists. Hit the over there. Um, Kuzma, I've got him for a few things. I've got AD for four boards. So, you know, the shit like that. But it's been working, and, and most times than not, I think this is gonna this is gonna pan out for me. It's better better than what I was doing most of the summer, and you know, months prior to or, or weeks prior to this new little scheme I'm thinking of here that I've been going with. So, yeah, not losing money anymore. <laughs> Knock on wood. Um, you know, today is, you know, as I said, it's February 4th, but that means it's, it's Linsanity Day. It's been nine years. Today is, today, February 4th, nine years ago, was the, I guess you could say the official start of Jeremy Lin's Linsanity. You know, that, that like, I don't know, we'll say like two and a half week stretch from early February, you know, weeks of, two and a half weeks worth of games from early February to like... I don't know, a week and a half or so into March, where he, you know, went on that torrid pace, and, you know, while Melo was sitting out, and he started winning games for the Knicks, and that was when everybody was like, man, Melo's not the answer, let's just build around Jeremy Lin. <laughs> but that was it, I remember today, uh, I saw an Instagram post for, from, you know, some Knicks fan page I follow, but I also, I always remember this day, because 
um, during Lynn's sanity, it wasn't exactly today, I was on vacation with my family in upstate New York uh, nine years ago. Wow, nine years. And, um, you know, we were on vacation in upstate New York doing some skiing shit, snow tubing, I think it was actually, snow tubing. <laughs> and, um, you know, we went to this restaurant, this bar, um, and the Knicks were playing. And, you know, I, I think they were playing the Lakers at the time, where, and, and Lynn dropped 38 points on them. Uh, you know, Kobe Bryant and the Lakers, rest in peace, Kobe. And the Knicks, I'm uh, pretty sure they won that game. They dropped, he dropped 38. This was like at the beginning of Lynn's sanity. And so, I, I, was, I was not a Knicks fan at the time. I didn't watch basketball anymore. I, you know, as a kid, I used to watch a lot of the, uh, the NJ Nets. But for a while, I just got away from the game. And, you know, so I was randomly watching this game, this Knicks game at the bar in upstate New York. And, you know, I was intrigued. I was like, wow, this Jeremy Lin kid is fun. You know, let me keep watching him. And, again, this is in 2011. And so, or 2012, it was February of 2012. Um, and so from there on out, I was like, all right, I'm going to stick with this Knicks team. And I'll watch, you know, games here and there. I didn't watch like a diehard yet, but after that insanity stretch, I, you know, I caught a game here and there. I was more intrigued and started to get more into bet and into hoops. And so the following year comes, 2012, 2013 season. I, you know, I'm, a, right, you know, I'm gonna stick with it, see what's up. And that's the year, obviously, you know, that summer, heading into the 2012-13 season, I start to look more into the Knicks, look at the roster. You know, I, I, I fall in love with this guy, Carmelo Anthony. I become a huge fan of him. I get his sneakers, and that's those, those sneakers on top here. And if you're watching the podcast, those are the M8s. Um, and I bought those the summer of 2012 um, heading into that season. And that's when Melo went off, and that's where I started watching the Knicks religiously. So I always say, Linsanity got me back into the Knicks. Melo kept me around. And, uh, and obviously here I am still today. <laughs> None of them on the roster anymore. Um, I don't even think Lynn's in the NBA anymore. And uh, Melo's obviously on the, on the later years of his career here. So it's just crazy. What a run it's been for, for me as a Knicks fan. Um, you know, I guess you could say nine years going strong here as a Knicks fan. And, you know, unfortunately we still haven't done much. Um, but... Things are looking somewhat promising here in 2021 for the Knicks. <laughs> so we're going to get into that um, tonight. Uh, we have a lot to get into. We're going to break down the two Chicago games. And we're also going to go over the first progress report of the season, being that we are just about a third of the way through. So we'll do that. We'll break down the games. We'll go over the progress report. You know, go over the entire roster top to bottom. Uh, review Tom Thibodeau, the coaching staff for the Knicks as a whole. You know, we'll give grades to each individual as best as we can. And then, um, yeah, I'm hoping this is a this is a good episode for you guys. It's going to be, you know, I'm hoping it's over an hour. So we have a lot of stuff to discuss. And um, that'll be that. So let's, let's um, yeah, let's do this. Let's, let's head to break. And then when we get back, uh, when we get back, we'll, we'll get right into the swing of things here. And we'll start analyzing a bit and you know we'll, we'll summarize the first two games and then we'll get into the thick of things all right so uh before we get into break though i do want to remind you guys that if you haven't yet subscribed to my podcast um which obviously you're listening to right now bd4 be sure to go and subscribe uh you can subscribe to the podcast um on my website if you want to find where to subscribe to the podcast and the many platforms the podcast is on and if you want to find where to subscribe to my blog that i write obviously on the knicks and yankees as well um and follow me on social media all that stuff if you want to find all that just go to my link tree uh go to link tr.ee slash rj carbone that will take you to my link tree it'll have the links to all three of my social media outlets and it'll have the link to my website which displays the many podcast feeds that bd4 is on and it'll also you know on the website obviously that's where my blog is so just go to my link tree for all that information once again link tr.ee slash rj carbone and that'll take you right there so guys thank you for tuning in i appreciate you stopping by each and every one of you um so let's head to break and when we get back we'll discuss everything all right be right back 
Hey fellas, so really quick before we get back into the show, I do want to remind you that if you haven't yet subscribed to this podcast or subscribed to my blog or followed me on social media even, you can do all that by going to my link tree. Just go to linktr.ee slash RJ Carbone. That is linktr.ee slash RJ Carbone. Guys, thanks so much. Let's get back to the show. All right. So, yeah. So, Monday night on the 1st, um, the Knicks took on the Bulls. And, again, this is a, a two-game set we had against them. Uh, so, the first game against the Bulls, the Knicks ended up losing. They uh, lost 110-102. to 102. You know, Tom Thibodeau entering this, this one facing his former squad. Sorry. I don't know if you could hear me there. For some reason, I'm so I have a Surface Pro, and Cortana is very sensitive. So if you say, you know, hey, blank, um, anything that resembles Cortana's name, this shit picks it up and it messes with everything. So I hope I didn't just cut out there. Uh, but if I did, I was saying um, Knicks took the 110 to 102 loss to Chicago. Yeah, obviously, Tom Thibodeau heading into Chicago facing his former team where he spent most of his career. Uh, obviously, different front office now, though, so kind of a different feeling. But still, you know, you always want to beat your former team, and uh, the Knicks couldn't do that in, in the first game of the set. Uh, this is a game with, you know, a lot of lead changes. I think there were 15 lead changes in this one. Um, it's a game where the Knicks had issues, just like in, in the LAC game prior to this one. They had issues defending the three-point arc, right? Um... You know, they allowed Markkinen to just go off. By the way, Clyde, the amount of times Clyde just butchers this guy name, this guy's name, it's not, sometimes it's Markkinen, other times it's, what was it, the other one he was like Markin or some shit like that. It's, it's, it's a little insufferable, but whatever. Um, little shit like that, can't be bothered by. <laughs> so Mark, Markkinen, uh, goes for 30 points. He hit six three-pointers on us. Uh, five of them came in the first half. So we allowed him to shoot 12 of them. Anyways. Zach Levine goes for 21. He has three triples. Um, and then you get 13 apiece from Kobe White and Thaddeus Young, uh, a sophomore and a vet. Uh, they each hit a three-pointer themselves as well. So just couldn't defend the arc. Knicks were just laid on rotations and you know, just messing up those rotations because of miscommunications and getting confused a lot of the times and, you know, going under the screen way too much. We were going beneath the screen and that killed us, uh, just leaving too much space. And even in these in these scenarios where we're guarding off the ball, we were just leaving too much space, sagging off. Um, it was ugly and we were just getting obliterated by screens, pick and roll, pick and pop just getting killed uh, the backdoor cut became an issue we were way too sluggish and they were killing us backdoor you know, a lot of the time it was ugly um and, and offensively it was a game where the nick the nick offense couldn't do much they were pretty inconsistent you know they were they're not hitting the three ball they were only six for 29 21 percent from distance the ball movement was not pretty you know it was just uh 21 assists on 37 field goals and Chicago, on the other hand, 30 assists on their 42 field goal makes. So, you know, they were moving the ball a lot much better. And because of that, they were making a lot more shots, getting better looks. Um, Randall did lead all categories with another amazing line, 23, 11, and 7. Um, but in the second half, he kind of became the Randall of, of 2019, 2020, where... And I'm not blaming him because he's like the only legitimate scoring option outside of R.J. Barrett. So he's getting double teamed a lot, triple teamed a lot lately. And he was kind of, uh, there were a few turnovers, a few bad turnovers there in the second half for Randall on his plate of five. But regardless, he, he gave his best effort. R.J. Barrett, 14-7-3, but he needed 17 shots to get the 14. Not great, but he did get it going a bit in the third quarter. Um, IQ. Did not shoot particularly well on Monday, um, but still finished with 16, 6, and 7. And it was nice to see the biggest minutes disparity of the season, too. Um, Alfred Payton was given just 18 that night and quickly was given 30. So that was a, a nice change. Um, what else do we have here? 
Uh, yeah, uh, the second leading scorer outside of Randall it was, it was Alec Burks. Uh, he had 18 points, 6 for 12, 3 of 6 from deep. Um, he looked like the Burks from early on before the injury. Uh, so that was nice to see. New Orleans Noel played well. You know, Mitch obviously got into some early foul trouble. Noel came in, 28 minutes, uh, 8 points, 7 boards, and had 5 blocks. Um, he did look really bad, though, in the fourth quarter defensively, and we'll get to that. Um, speaking of bad, uh, Monday night, Bullock was pretty fucking useless again, as was Austin Rivers. The two combined uh, combined for 5 points on 1 for 11 shooting, missing all 7 3-pointers they took. So... That happened. Um, so, so to summarize it, um, the first quarter comes and we get off to a nice start. RJ, Mitch, Randall all start off pretty nicely. You know, Barrett throws a pick and roll lob to Mitch, two nothing. Bullock throws one up to Mitch. Mitch puts another. Mitch puts another one in. Scores the first four points for the Knicks, four nothing. Uh, Randall starts cooking, hits a couple of mid range J's. Uh, meanwhile, though, you know, Laurie Markinen is just cooking. You know, he he. Mitch gets into foul trouble, and Markinen starts to cook Randall, and, you know, a three ball, a dunk, and then some more threes later on. And, you know, the first quarter, by the end of it, the Knicks allow 32 points to the Bulls, and they allow them to shoot 58% from the field. So, you know, it was pretty lethargic, just going through the motions. It looked like a pretty lifeless defensive effort right out of the gate. Uh, second quarter comes, the Knicks manage to stay in the game with their free throw shooting, you know, on their way to a 22 for 26, 85% showing. Um, and Randall's also scoring well. IQ kind of gets it going with some floaters and a dime or two. Um, but we were still missing for three, and we finished the first half, again, very inconsistent from the field at 40%, below 40% from the field. Um, meanwhile, Laurie Markinen is dropping 11 points in the second half of the second quarter. So he kind of, you know, has a little bit of a microwave stretch. Uh, the Bulls are moving the ball, playing at a fast pace, hitting perimeter shots, and those couple of things are obviously not the Knicks' strength, right? The Knicks are a team who play slow. Uh, the Bulls are a team who play fast, and they assisted on 20 of their 23 makes in the first half. So the Knicks headed to break down, but still in the game, 59-55. to 55. Uh, Out of the gate in the third quarter, RJ gets it going. Um... Hits a few shots in a row. Towards the end of the third, he has that beautiful slam dunk in transition. Um, but obviously, the Knicks just can't defend. And Levine and Marketing, they kept hot that quarter. They were just killing the Knicks. And eventually, the Knicks were down 79-73 to 73, um, later in the third. You know, Levine kicks one to Temple. Temple hits a big three. They're down 82-73. to 73, Not looking good at the time. Fortunately, Randall kind of gets hot towards the end of the quarter. A couple nice feeds. He hits Alec Burksford uh, Alec Burks for a jumper. Uh, then later finds a cutting Noel in transition with about under 30 seconds left in the third. So the Knicks go, uh, go into the fourth quarter down just 82-79. Uh, the fourth quarter comes. Uh, Manuel quickly checks back in. Hits a few shots at the top of the period. Floater, a three ball. Brings the Knicks within a point, 87 to 86, um, with about nine minutes and change to go. But the Bulls keep attacking the Knicks with pick and roll, pick and pop, and killing the Knicks inside and outside for a bit. Levine hits a step back three, puts the Bulls up 94 90, you know, the first half of the fourth quarter. Uh, the Knicks kind of counter with some big shots, though. You know, later on, RJ hits IQ for a three. This gives the Knicks their, their first lead in a while, 95-94, to 94, with about three and a half to go. Uh, the Knicks then lose the lead, but Randall helps regain the lead, gets a strong left-handed take with about under three minutes to go, so they're back up. But then again, here we go. It's like a back-and-forth game. The Knicks just keep playing painful defense, and this is where the, the kind of downfall of Noel happened this, this game. Uh, he just gets lost on a pick-and-roll, helping on the perimeter, allows an easy bucket under the rim. Levine then hits a stop and pop mid-range. And, you know, the Knicks fight back, fight back, fight back. And they kind of get a big three, though, from Alec Burks. So you're thinking once again, all right, maybe there's hope. But here we go. Noel gets lost on another fucking screen in the following possession. That leads you know, to, to some nice ball movement. And eventually they find, oh, it was Kobe White in the corner for three. Puts the Bulls back on top, 103-100, with about 40 seconds left. Um, then the Knicks continue to really just 
have issues defending. Levine hits a couple of really clutch shots. Um, you know, it was the big one that sealed the deal uh, from downtown where Noel and Burks kind of get screwed up on a screen. Burks, I don't know why, goes under on a screen from Markkanen. Um, he, it looked like he had space to go over the screen, but he gets caught, goes under, and Noel kind of doesn't pick up. He starts to trail the roller, but by then he leaves way too much space for Levine, who just pops it in his face. And that was kind of like the good night shot of the night and uh, put the Knicks away. So that was uh, that was Monday. That was the 110 to 102 loss on Monday again. The big, I would say the big um, contributor to the Knicks losing that one is, is it was the three point line, right? On both ends. They couldn't hit three, the three, and they couldn't defend the three. So that was that. Uh, so let's head to break, and when we get back from break, we will get into game two. All right? Be right back. Hey, fellas. So really quick, before we get back into the show... I do want to remind you that if you haven't yet subscribed to this podcast or subscribed to my blog or followed me on social media even, you can do all that by going to my link tree. Just go to linktr.ee slash rjcarbone. That is linktr.ee slash rjcarbone. Guys, thanks so much. Let's get back to the show. So 107 to 103, I think it was, right? Uh, yeah, 107 to 103, the Knicks take the victory uh, over Chicago on Wednesday night. Not the most satisfying of wins. It was kind of an ugly win, but, you know, as the old adage goes, a win is a win. Um, yeah, <laughs> they, they almost blew it. Uh, but in the end, they, they made some big adjustments, uh, adjustments for Monday, right? It was the three-point shooting that was the biggest disparity. Um, you know, on Monday they got killed, but here they go out there and they defend the three-point line really well on Wednesday night. They make the, uh, they force the Bulls to some bad looks and the Bulls end up going six out of 36, 17% from distance. And remember specifically in game one, it's Lowry, uh, Lowry Markkinen and it's Zach Levine combining for 51 on nine for 15 from the arc. That was Monday, but here in, uh, on Wednesday, they both combined for just 33 on 0 for 8 from distance. So a big, drastic drop-off from them because the Knicks glue them. The Knicks, you know, they adjust and they um, they made up for it. So, you know, I think the only Chicago Bull who shot decently from downtown was uh, Valentine, who was 3 for 7, so good job on the arc defensively and on the other hand they were a solid 11 for 22 the Knicks from uh, three point distance and you know that's that's obviously not great you know it's not a lot of threes but it's 50% and when the Knicks are shooting well that's probably that's usually what you're getting you're not going to get a ton of attempts the volume still going to be pretty low even when they shoot well but you know when you defend it well and you shoot 50% you're going to win most nights so it was Randall who was uh, five for seven from three point distance, tying a career high, which I think he had last year with the Knicks. Um, and then the bench um, combined to go five for nine from three point distance. So a good collective effort from three. Uh, but yeah, Randall leads the way with five three pointers. Uh, he has 27 points, six rebounds, and six assists. I was very happy he got that six rebound because I needed that for my for my parlay, and I hit that last minute. Um, RJ goes for 17 and 7 on 50%. Alfred Payton goes, this is a big night for him. He goes for 20. Uh, he did take 19 shots, so even on his best nights, he's like above average, barely. Uh, so he goes for 20 points on 19 shots. Uh, also has 8 rebounds, 4 assists, and plays 35 minutes the night after playing only 18. So uh, IQ goes for 9 points in 13 minutes. So microwave scoring, but he didn't play much. Uh, Mitch. Eight boards. I'm sorry. Eight rebound. Uh, eight points. Eleven rebounds, and uh, he had two steals in 28 minutes. And so that was, you know, pretty much it for the stats. Um, but quarter to quarter here, you know, the first period, the Knicks come out, and Alfred Payton's off to a really strong start. He gets 
you know, he scores 10 points and he has seven rebounds alone in that first quarter. Um, he's going going strong and he's feeding everybody. You know, RJ, Julius, and Mitch each chiming in too in that first quarter. They have pretty good starts to the night. Um, you know, Mitch is crashing the glass. The Knicks. Uh, they were up 17-8 to eight on the glass early on in the first, 6-1 uh, to one on the offensive glass. So big difference early on there on the rebounds, and, and that led to a 37 to, or a 34-17 to 17 first quarter advantage for New York. So a 17-point lead right out of the gate. Uh, second quarter comes, quickly comes in. Uh, he plays with the starters for a bunch. Have some defensive struggles. You know, Levine ends up scoring 10 points out of his 24 on the night. Uh, the Bulls... You know, kind of get it going a bit, and they shave that Nick lead down to nine at the break. Uh, third quarter comes, Knicks kind of get sloppy. They have six of their 17 turnovers in the quarter. Not good. The Bulls, you know, at one point go on a 12 to 2 run. Peyton starts to cool off. IQ not really getting much time, only a couple of minutes in the period. Levine, 10 more points in the third. Um, but fortunately, towards the end of the quarter, to wrap up, um, the third, the Knicks go on an 8-2 run. Randall hits a big three-point shot uh, heading into the fourth, and the Knicks go into the period up 15 again, 91-76. Fourth quarter comes, and <laughs> it gets ugly. It gets really, really ugly. Um, gosh, Alfred Payton's still not as hot as he was in that first half. Um, IQ, despite Payton not being the same, uh, Emmanuel quickly. Not really getting a lot of love here. Not getting playing time. I did not like that. Um, he was, again, 9 points in 13 minutes. Yeah, I would have played him. Uh, but he did. He wasn't out there, and Peyton was out there not doing much. Um, but again, you can't you can't blame Peyton because he had 28-4 and four by the end. Um, yeah, the Knicks just struggled offensively, though. Everybody was, like, slumping. They only had 16 points in the period, and they shot just 30%, 6 for 20. Really bad. Um... They almost blew it. You know, 14 to 3 Bulls run made it a seven point game at one point. Uh, but later on, you know, Levine finds Marketing for a driving dunk, and that makes it a three point game. Uh, so it was looking really rough. And, you know, we were kind of running out of time here to not choke this one away. It looked like it was another you know, classic Knicks choke jobs. And kind of would have been the first classic Knicks choke job of the season. We haven't really seen them knock on friggin' wood, blow. You know, leads so big. Um, but fortunately, you know, the biggest play of the night by far, no question about it. We get that Julius Randle assist, huge assist while he's driving to the, uh, drives in the lane and he, he kicks it to fucking uh, Reggie Bullock in the corner for three. Bullock finally hits the three, he drills it, and boom, that was kind of the good night shot for the Knicks, right? That was their version of Zach Levine's three in, uh, on Monday. So Bullock hits the big shot. Randall with the big assist. He would have not made that pass last season. He goes right into traffic and probably fumbles it and turns it over. And the Knicks probably lose that game. But this year he makes the quick decision. Kicks it to Bullock for three in the corner. And boom. That was the official seal the deal shot of the night. So a good win, man. It was a, you know, not a pretty win, but it was good to get a win, I'll say. You know, and again, you, you take it. At this point with this team, you know, where they were these last couple of years, these are wins you're not going to see with old Knicks teams of the past. This is a, a Tom Thibodeau type of win in the way that they grinded and they fought hard defensively. Um, and that's how most of their wins have came, right? If it's not Randall or Barrett or both scoring the ball, it's the defensive effort that's been keeping them in these games. So they get their 10th win in 23 games, making them 10-13. and 13. Uh, That's like... 435 ball on the year percentage wise you know 43 percent winning clip so that's not bad at all um and you know listen it was a good game right again uh leading the team in points um randall uh peyton second and 20 points and can we not be reactionary here you know because uh, the articles i was reading the tweets i was seeing the comments I was reading, and I spend too much time on the internet, so maybe it's just me overreacting, but I mean, can we not be so reactionary and such prisoners of the moment? Listen, I'm glad for him. Here, I'm glad. Alfred Payton played well. I never root against any Nick, but you've got to be kidding me, right? 
I mean, the, there are people who are saying, oh, this is why Alfred Payton should be starting. Alfred Payton proving a point here, showing why he needs to be starting. This is why you don't give up on veterans. Shut up. Dude, shut the fuck up. I mean, come on. I'm not even trying to get... Like, come on, really? That's just as irrational as those idiots who were calling R.J. Barrett a bust when he was you know, going through that four-game slump from hell. That's the same exact thing as that. That is the same exact thing. And, and, you know, even more illogical here, are we counting one above average night for Alfred Payton? Are we putting more value into that than what Emmanuel Quickly has done? Playing like a rookie of the year? Are we, are we valuing one above average night from EP over a number of really great outings from Quickly? And again, it shouldn't even be about results. It should be a young player with upside over a you know, mediocre veteran who's already peaked, you know, who's been the same player since day one of his career. Not part of this long-term plan, as many others are, aren't on this roster. It just... Stop it. Stop it. And speaking of Twitter, standing for this guy all of a sudden after one night, um, I'm st I heard... <laughs> I heard Alfred Payton... Uh, people are... People are uh, what's it called, though? speculating here that Alfred Payton has his own burner account. <laughs> I was, I was, I looked it up and, you know, I, I think his name was like Knicks fan six or something. <laughs> I mean, how could you be any less subtle than that? <laughs> but it, it was Knicks fan six who happens to only tweet before and after the games, never during the games. And, you know, obviously he just rides Payton. Um, you know, they asked him, you know, somebody in the comments asked on one of his tweets, why aren't you tweeting during the games? And he's like, oh, I work during the games. It's like, oh, really? Do you happen to work for 48 minutes a night? <laughs> it looks like it is Peyton. It's pretty funny. Because you see shit like this all the time. Obviously, the KD thing. Uh, Yankees fans were making fun of Brian Cashman for that BC Twitter handle that people were thinking was his burner. Um, but it's funny because it's yeah, the, this account is constantly backing Peyton. It's new. I think it's a new account. And he gets so much shit for it in the comments. And I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Did you see him get short with Clyde in the in the uh, post game? Kind of an attitude with him. An attitude, but like he was he was short with him. He was given these one, two, three word answers and not didn't crack a single smile. I guess he's just fed up with all the bullshit. You know, from Knicks fans, and, and I'm, I'm part of it. But what did Clyde do? Clyde's been backing this guy, to be honest with you. Clyde's been using the defense narrative. He's been using the veteran narrative. He's been using the it's it's who you finish with, not who you start narrative. <laughs> I don't know, man. I wouldn't get mad at Clyde. Could you imagine if MSG was crowded and had a crowd during this time? The amount of shit Peyton will be getting? Jesus. Toxic. <laughs> I'd be one of them. I'm not gonna lie. I'm an asshole fan, but listen, man. I, again, I don't hate the guy. I just, I just know, not think I know that he's not supposed to be the starting point guard for this team. I, I don't like it. I don't agree with it, and I, I'm sure Tom Thibodeau knows. I just, I guess he's just riding with what we have. He doesn't want to mess up the rhythm, which I, I guess I understand, but I don't agree with. Um, but hey, ten and 13, 23 games into the year. Keep this up and hope that hope that we keep winning, right? Uh, March 25th, I think, is the trade deadline. Obviously, much later this year, being that the season was delayed about a month. Um, you know, I I'm hearing a lot of talk. You know, I'm hearing a lot of talk. You know, what should the Knicks do at, at the deadline? Should they make a move? Should they stay put? You know, buy, sell, stay neutral. I would stay put, and, and I think they're gonna, you know, I maybe make some minimal moves, you know, some, but nothing major, right? Maybe, you know, they, they still do have $18 million on, in cap space remaining. So maybe look for some minor upgrades here. Um, I've heard about George Hill, maybe get George Hill to play some point guard. Honestly, I would take George Hill, you know, if quickly he's not going to start, I would not mind trying to make a deal for George Hill to be the starting point guard over over uh, Peyton and, you know, figure out a way there. But 
I don't think we're going to even do that. I honestly think we're going to do little to nothing. Uh, not even something like George Hill, you know. Uh, but, you know, George Hill would be cool. I wouldn't hate that. You know, he could at least score the ball and shoot the three ball, right? He could shoot. And that's an upgrade automatically, right? And IQ, keep letting, if we get George Hill, I have no problem with IQ doing his thing off the bench as that six-man scoring punch, right? Uh, but again, I think nothing major. Tibbs wants to win. Uh, what we're doing right now is is winning to an extent, right? Relative to to, to everything else. Um, you know, I just don't think we have the roster depth to make any major deals either, right? If we were to trade for you know one of the big names out there, everybody's talking about Bradley Beal, uh, Zach Levine, uh, Victor Oladipo, any any big names like that would likely take. Randall, who I don't think you want to move anymore, and we'll get to him. And if not Randall, it's going to be a lot of contributors on this roster. It's going to gut a good portion of the roster. So that's going to leave you in a situation where, you know, it can mess with the chemistry and ruin things. And, you know, the Knicks have a good thing going right now. You don't want to kind of screw with that. And if you do end up gutting your roster for a big star, it's going to leave you in a Carmelo Anthony-esque situation again, right? Where you have one guy and then surrounded by dog shit and he's not going to win you much games and it'll probably just be the same thing as Melo where he doesn't get you much because he doesn't have much help and, and you're left with nothing after he this guy leaves. So it's, it's not something I want to do right now. I think you have to stick with this plan here. Keep going with the process. Don't jump ahead. Trade for that star once you kind of establish yourself a solid foundation here. And the Knicks are not quite there yet, but they're getting there. And I think you should still wait it out. And you have a good building block in Julius Randle. So when we're talking about this Randle situation, you know, there are some options. And we're going to go over the four options um, that the Knicks have uh, as soon as we get back from break. So stick around. Guys, thank you for tuning in so far. If you have... Uh, subscribe. Thank you. If you haven't yet subscribed, be sure to do that right now. Go to my website and subscribe. Uh, you can follow me on social media to keep updated with the podcast and stuff. Um, for all that stuff, just you can follow my blog. For all that, just go to my link tree. It'll have the links to everything there. So go to linktr.ee slash rjcarbone. All right. So let's head to break. And when we get back, we'll uh, we'll discuss Julius Randall for a bit. All right, so one second. I want to see where I'm at with my parlay at the moment. I only need one, two, three, four more legs to hit. We are just at the start of the second half here. Hold on. Let's see. Please tell me I'm getting there. All right, so I need, let's see. LeBron's got the 17 points. Perfect. He's got four assists. He needs one more assist. Looks like Denver's going to cover that plus 25 knock on wood. Oh, wow. We're in good shape here. Okay, so I need one more assist from LeBron, and then I can worry about the spread and the over-under once it's over. I just need one assist from James. Come on, man. Ah, please. All right. So, Julius Randle. Yeah, that, that situation is interesting, right? It's it's crazy because we're going to get into my opinion on it all in a second. But so there are a, a few options, you know, Leon Rose and Scott Perry have here. You know, um, I, I think every, you know, competent minded GM, executive, president of basketball operations, you know, all the guys who make these decisions in the front office, every competent minded one of them at least listens to offers and picks up the phone, right? Especially in the situation the Knicks are in, right? Rebuilding, young, need some talent. So everybody, you know, everyone, every competent-minded individual in their front office will at least pick up the phone and see what you have, right? Listen to offers. So there's the, the option to move him at the deadline, 
for a top return, right? There's the option to move him in the summer maybe for a lesser return. Keep him for this year, see what you do. There's the option to extend him, right? Sometime between now and before the contract is up next year. And then there's the fourth option to let him play out the contract and risk losing him. So the number one here, um, you know, the, we're, we're coming up on the trade deadline in a month plus. You know, probably was the plan heading into the season was to try and find a partner for Randall before the deadline, right? We drafted Obi Toppin, uh, and we also did not expect this huge turnaround from Julius. Um, you know, we didn't expect to be winning, but with his great play, you know, his value's at his highest it's ever been. So you're thinking, okay, you know, maybe we can trade him to a contender. Um, they'll get two playoffs with him, and, you know, we can get hopefully a first or two first rounders in return. But it's like, you know, he's starting to look really promising here. You know, so maybe some people are wanting to move him in the summer. You know, for that superstar. Play him out, see where you end this season, and do we move him in the summer? But by then, he'll be on an expiring contract, right? Um, and the team that gets him will only have him for one playoff. And that team's going to risk losing him for more money. You know, if he's looking to get some more scuttle in the offseason. So that's probably not a scenario you want to look at either. Uh, there's no, The one who I, which I think is, is more realistic than anything is to extend this guy. And I can't believe I'm saying that. I mean, I, I have I've completely 180'd on this guy. Not just from last year, but for where I was a fucking month and a half, two months ago. I mean, I was just talking to one of my... No followers on the blog I was discussing whether the Knicks should keep Randall or flip him I was literally just discussing that a month ago and I was fully on the side of flipping this guy for a first rounder at the deadline no matter what the Knicks were doing but it's like as every day passes by and as we keep seeing these performances you know, 23 points 11 rebounds 6 assists um, he's shooting 48% on the season he's shooting about 48 uh, 40 percent from three after a year where he shot what 28 percent i mean 81 percent at the free throw stripe numbers across the board shooting splits averages are all up and he's playing he's playing defense too guys he's played you know i would like to say it's at least average to marginally above average defense you know, obviously he ball watches at times, but for the most part, he's been playing strong defense. He's a good on-ball defender in the post for sure. And he's 26 years old. So, you know what? With how great he is playing and with the Knicks having this success, I am go I, I am a sucker. I am a sucker right now. I'm not going to lie. I am a complete sucker. I am buying into this shit. Maybe you keep him as a building block. All right? So that's my... I would go with the option of extending this guy if he continues to play like this from here to the end of the season. But there's there's the the Obi Toppin thing. Do you if you're keeping Randall? I mean, there's there's no option but to try and move Toppin. And it's just again, this is something that we don't have to worry about at the moment. But eventually, it's going to come to in front of the Knicks' face. And if down the line you're, you're you're planning on using Randall as your building block, you package Toppin maybe in a trade for a star. You know, I really like Devonte Graham. I was really high on him last season. I know this season he's shooting the ball very inefficiently, but I'm still high on him. He's young. He's a guard who can dribble and shoot and score. Package Toppin in there. Maybe some of those picks that the Knicks have. Maybe Kevin Knox. I wouldn't hate that. If Randall keeps this up for for now, from now to the rest of the year, and it's looking like it's sustainable, you know he's he's had a large sample size under his belt already. Uh, and then there's the option, you know, which is very risky, and I don't think the Knicks will do, but let him play out the rest of his contract, which you could obviously just end up losing him for nothing. But yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would. Hang on to him, and, and maybe if he keeps this up, extend him. If he keeps this high level of play up by the end of the season, I would be 100% for extending him in the summer, and I cannot believe I'm saying that. I have completely 180'd. I have completely 180'd. I will eat my words. You know, last year I was saying 
this guy either needs a great point guard or a great coach to turn him into a winning player. But I also said, I don't think he's going to get that. So I think we should just trade him while we can. And once the draft happened, I was 110% for trading this guy. I was an asshole about it. And here we are. He is performing out of his mind. You know, how many guys in the league right now are dropping 20, 10, and 5? I, I wish I had that in front of me, because, but I, I'm sure it's not too many. And I'm sure the names that have, that are dropping that, those lines are pretty big ass names, right? I've got to imagine Luka Doncic is on that list. Um, I don't know who else, who else. Giannis is on that list. There's not many, and those those are big top five players. But I mean, how many guys are doing that? that that's impressive. So a rare talented player like that. He's a really good fucking player. And he's not just an all-star this year. He's a top player in the game this season. The way he's playing. So honestly, guys, I would just... I, I would I would stick with what we got. Don't fuck with anything. Keep doing what we're doing. Stand pat at the deadline. Um, you know, one thing I don't want to do is to sell heavy and, and trade Randall, Burke, and more and, and just tank, tank. I don't want to head towards tanking territory. I think tanking... You all know my opinion on that. I, I say it all the time. I think it's toxic, very unhealthy. It's it's a loser mentality, right? That rewards losing. I don't think you should ever be rewarded for losing consistently. I think that's disgusting, pathetic, and it, it's disturbing to me. Um, and plus, we did that shit enough. I mean, Knicks fans are tired of this. Um, you know, Breen says it all the time on the broadcast. Nobody wants to come to a team like that, right? It, it'll restrict you in free agency. You know, because nobody wants to come to a team that consistently loses 50 games plus a year. It doesn't help the culture, no. I think in order to build that culture that we've been trying to build these last couple of years, you need to string together some wins, and we're finally doing that. So, honestly, I would hang on to Randall. Hang on to everybody else right now. It's just stick with what we have. You know, we're at a point where, again, we're a third into the season. We have more of a good idea, a solid idea of, of what this team is this year. That's a team that's going to win games with their defense and have their occasional moments offensively. Um, and it, you know, it'll be from Randall and RJ most likely doing the work. Um, so, yeah. And plus, this whole tanking thing. We have, let's remember, we have the Dallas Mavericks pick this year. We have their 2021 pick. And the Mavericks, you know, speaking of, they are not doing so hot. They are not doing so hot. They are not doing so hot, guys. They just lost their, what, seventh of their last eight? Okay. They are looking like they're at least, you know, going to be in the lottery. You know, whether that's high lotto or low lotto, the Mavs don't look good this year, and that is huge. That is huge for the Knicks. So, listen, I I am not for tanking. I think we should just keep trying to win games and keep doing it with the youth, which is the most important part, and you know, worry about ourselves and see where the Mavericks land by the end of the year. We'll take whatever pick we end up with, and then we'll take whatever they get. That's huge. And it's a pretty stacked draft class, so even if it's a later first, Maybe we end up getting, you know, another good pick late first. It's funny how this whole thing is working out, right? With with the Mavericks thing, you know, did did did, did we win the Tingus Pingus deal? <laughs> did, did, did we win it? You know, it, it's not even really. It doesn't even have to be about the Mavericks. Like if we win or 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 not. It's just as long as we did good from it, right? Fuck them. Who cares about what they're doing? As long as the Knicks did something pretty great from it, that's what matters. So think about it. We shipped Porzingis off, right? That clears some cap, you know, so we don't have to pay him in the future. And we also got rid of Hardaway and his contract. So we cleared some cap. And we used that cap to sign Julius Randle, who, again, looks like a solid building block right now. And his numbers are actually much better than KP's. Um, Tingus Pingus, who has, you know, obviously he's got these health issues. Right? He's got these issues with the health. And, you know, guys at that height, 
injuries to the lower body, it's not easy to deal with. So how long will his career be? He's got those questions. But listen, we got Randall from it, and we got you know the the we we signed Marcus Morris, who we eventually you know a couple of swaps later, blah blah blah, use that Marcus Morris trade to get Emmanuel quickly. So we have Randall, we have Emmanuel quickly. And we have their draft pick. And I think we also have another one of their picks. It might be in 2023. It's looking pretty promising for us, guys. <laughs> it's looking pretty damn promising. And again, with the Mavs losing this year, you know, I think right now they have to jump like three teams uh, just to enter the play-in tournament. You know, that 10th seed. So, <laughs> hey, the Tingus Pingus deal from two years ago is not looking too bad right now. You know, sure, the DSJ thing is not looking promising, right? That guy looks like a bust and a half. He's obviously right now playing with Westchester. Um, but, you know, hopefully he can, you know, find something and we can move him for whatever we get. Um, but, you know, in, in a way, this is working out well for us. We, you know, if you kind of dig into it and nitpick a little bit, we got the cap space for these players, and these players are really doing good for us, and they're looking promising. So it's funny how that whole thing's working out. Um, Plus, you look at the, you know, speaking of, you know, going back to where we were about trying to, to, to finish out the rest of the season doing what we're doing and trying to win these games, I have the schedule written down here for, for the remainder of the first half, right? Because we don't have the second half schedule hasn't been released yet. So it's looking pretty doable. And, and knock on wood, you know, if the Knicks keep playing hard, it's looking pretty doable. So we've got Portland next, and Portland is a seventh seed. They're a beatable team. Right, they're a beatable team. They've been inconsistent these last couple seasons. They're beatable. Uh, we've got Miami twice. They're the 13th seed. They're not playing really good this year. They've had injuries. We've got Washington. They're a fucking mess. 14th seed. Uh, we've got Houston, the ninth seed, 10 and 10. Nothing, you know, nothing special. They don't have James Harden anymore. They're beatable. Um, there's Atlanta. I have here. They're the sixth seed, but again, they're beatable. We've we've competed with them. They're a sub 500 team. Uh, Orlando's the 12th seed. The Spurs, nothing special anymore. The 8th seed, they're going to give you competition, but beatable. The Timberwolves have the worst record in basketball. The Warriors, 9th seed, you know they're 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 a good team. They can you know they gave us a run for their money, but we did beat them the other night. Sacramento's 11th. Indiana's the fifth seed. We split with them. We beat them last time out on the second January 2nd, about a month ago. Uh, Detroit also have. The worst record in basketball. Uh, play San Antonio again. And I think that's the final game of the first half. So I mean, there's a chance here where the Knicks keep playing good basketball. Play hard and keep getting good performances from Randall, RJ, Robinson on the defensive end. Quickly keeps thriving. There's a chance the Knicks could, at the end of the year, you know, whatever their schedule is in the in the second half, if they take care of the first half like they've been so far, they, they end up with 30, 35 wins on the year. And that will be, you know, north of 400 in terms of their winning percentage. And that's a, a big improvement, honestly. And again, last year they were at this, you know, what, 21 and 45? That's what? Like 32% of the games they won? And that was with the youth not getting a bunch of burn. This year the youth is getting a ton of burn. And we're winning games. So that's the scenario we want it. Remember, it's not about how many wins. It's about how you get their wins. And the Knicks are getting their wins with a lot of the youth playing well. Randall, R.J. Barrett, Robinson, Quickly, all those guys playing really good. So speaking of how the Knicks are playing and, and, and certain guys performing really good, we're going to head to break one last time. And then we're get into the, uh, we'll get into the progress report. We'll go over the roster individually. And then at the end, we'll, we'll kind of give the Knicks a grade as a whole. You know, Tom Thibodeau and the staff. So let's head to break one more time. Uh, guys, if you haven't subscribed yet to the podcast, be sure to subscribe uh, to subscribe to the podcast, BD4, on my website. You can also follow my blog and follow me on social media. Uh, to find all that information, just go to my link tree, which will have the links to all of you know my, my, my outlets. Uh, go to linktr.ee slash RJ Carbone. We will be right back, and as soon as we get back, we'll get into the progress report.
All right, so all of a sudden, dude, it's like it's looking like I'm not even gonna hit the over. Fucking third quarter is about to end, and it's 81.75. I've got the 200 and uh, 200.5, 200 and a half. I have the over on that. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, the Nuggets cooled off tremendously. Shit. If I lose because I don't get the over on 200 and a half, that's fucked up. <laughs> this is modern. This is 2021. Hold on, let me see if LeBron has that fourth assist. Yes, he got it. Okay, so I got the fourth assist. Most likely, hopefully, without choking, I'll get the Denver to cover the plus 25 and a half. I just got to worry about that over-under. 83.75, so what's that? Hey Siri, what's 83 plus 75? 158. Hey Siri, 201 minus 158. 243. So 43 cut in half is like 20. Okay, it's 20 and change. It's possible. All right. Eh, pray for me. All right. All right, so let's get into the progress report because I want to, uh, you know, I want to go over some things here. Um, may as well start with Randall, right? Because we just spoke about him. Um, I don't. I, it's tough for me to really give one grade. Um, what I'm going to do is like give two. I'll give the borderline grades. You know, so for Randall, for example, I have for Randall, I gave him an A slash A plus. So he's in that range. Yeah, I mean, he's, what else is there to say? We pretty much said it all. He went from a losing player who put up empty stats to a winning player who's putting up efficient, productive stats and has become this all-star caliber player. Right, where would the Knicks be without Julius? Right, they're ten and thirteen. Take him off of this roster, replace him with an even average player. You're five and eighteen, maybe worse. Right, so we pretty much spoke about what we need to speak. This guy's averaging twenty three, eleven, seven on really efficient shooting splits. Again, every category, every major category, is improved from last season with Julius. R.J. Barrett, I have him B plus slash A minus. You know, I think he's playing really good. R.J. is playing to his strengths this season, right? He's balling out right now. Last dozen games, he's 19, 6, and 3 on 50, 40, 80 splits. Um, and he's averaging just 2.93 attempts a night during that span. So that's huge, right? He's playing to his bread and butter. He's playing in that mid-range. He's his mid-range shooting is up about 5% from last year, so that's good. Um, but he's also attacking the rim, drawing fouls, going downhill in transition, you know, posting up when he gets that mismatch in the half court. So he's playing to his strengths. And he's, again, we always say he's modeling his game after the guys we need him to do it. You know, DeRozan, right? That's That's been a big comp um, when it comes to RJ. I also love that he's just being more assertive lately. We're noticing lately he's calling for a lot of um, isolations, right? He's called for isos, and I think three games in a row we've seen him kind of direct traffic and call for the iso on the weak side. So that's been a positive to see. I always want to see him on the ball a lot, and when he's in iso, he's pretty good at crafting his way to the rim, if that's even a word. Um, but it's good. It's, it's you know, and people are worried about his three-point shooting, I know, but it has improved. Again, he's 50, 40, 80 over the last dozen games, and Let's remember, he, he doesn't need that three ball just yet. I have no problem with RJ continuing to play, again, to his strengths and just thriving inside the arc. And That three ball, if he continues to improve on, you know, which he has so far, it'll gradually come. Right down the line, maybe one to two years from now, he'll become a 33% three-point shooter, and that's all we need him to be. We don't need him to be a lights-out guy. Um, I just want him to hit the timely ones, hit the open ones, and by the end of the year, if he can hover around, you know, 33, 34%, I'll live with it. Um, but again, even DeRozan, even Butler aren't even at those numbers. They, they don't even shoot that high, and they're in the 20% a lot of the time, and they, they are top players in this game, especially Butler, who's he, he's, who he's been compared to. Um, Dwayne Wade, you know, he's... Not exactly athletic like Dwayne Wade, but RJ has a game where, he, again, he thrives in the mid-range and he's a good slasher like D8 was. So, yeah, RJ, I give a B-plus, A-minus. Um, I also give a B-plus, A-minus to Emmanuel quickly, right? Guys, a breath of fresh air every time he comes in. 
Um, he's obviously had some inconsistencies. He does need to work on finding a mid-range jumper. Um, the shot selection can be a bit wild at times. He loves those, you know, 30-plus footers from three. Um... Uh, he likes to do that jump pass, passing in midair, not always ideal. Um, so it was a little reckless. The defense isn't great. Sometimes he gets caught on the screen, and he's always chasing people at their hips. But offensively, he's a breath of fresh air. He, you know, again, he's in the rookie of the year conversation for a reason. He's averaging 12 points, uh, three assists, and shooting 37% from the arc in 19 minutes. <clears throat> excuse me. So, <clears throat> uh, excuse me. So, um, Manuel quickly is playing really good, comes into the game, he's that energy boost, plays at a high pace, quick, uh, Peyton doesn't do that, he, shoot, again, shoots the ball, he moves it around, uh, distributes pretty well, he's got that floater, he loves that in-between game with the floater, um, then he's got the three ball, you know, always come through in the clutch in the fourth quarter with the deep threes, um, so, you know, down the line, I still think he's probably a really good, uh, strong sixth man of the year type of guy. But again, right now, not having a point guard, not having a credible starting point guard, I, I still think he should be starting Emmanuel quickly. So, um, but right now, with within the role he's in right now, he's thriving. He, so I give him a B plus, A minus um, on the year so far. Uh, Mitchell Robinson, uh, B plus, A minus for Mitchell Robinson. Again, so so we're going from the, the top grades all the way down to the bottom. So that's how we're doing this. Uh, B plus, A minus, Mitchell Robinson. I think he's had amazing improvements defensively. Uh, yes, he is blocking the ball a little bit less. But that's because he's not trying to block every every single shot. right? And that's he's being more disciplined. He's fouling less. You know, he's finally starting every night. And he's getting about 30 minutes, and he's doing really, really well. Uh, I still would like to see him get about two to four minutes more per night, become that 34 minutes guy, 33, 34 minutes guy. You know, see if he can finally average a double double. That would be cool. Right now, he's about nine and eight with under two blocks. I think if the Knicks feed him some more down low, you know, in the dunker spot. Um, maybe feed him more on those pick and rolls, throw him some more lobs. You know, he could really become a double digit point thre threat. You know, there's there's six games all year. He's only had six games with eight plus field goal attempts. And in those games, he's reached double figures all but once. So when he gets the attempts, he he he's efficient. Um, I just think we need to do it more. It's not always easy. It's easier said than done. But I still think there's room there to feed Mitch more than, you know, was he getting five, six shots a night at the moment? You know, there's, there's been 11 games, 11 out of his 23 games this year, he's had five or less shot attempts. So I think we need to feature him a bit more. Um, you know, some of his, his issues, um, he obviously needs an offensive game himself to create for himself. He needs some kind of mid-range, maybe a post game. Forget about the three-point game. That's never happening. Um but outside of basic rim running right now, he doesn't really have an offensive game. So I get it. Right? A lot of that is his fault. But again, while we're fi waiting for him to find something uh, of a go-to move, aside from cleaning up the glass and, and throwing down the lob, keep throwing him more lobs. You know, while we're waiting for that post game, whatever it is to develop, keep throwing him more lobs. Um, I, I think he needs to set harder screens, which he's improved on the screen setting this year. Um, the handles are, you know, it's, it's, he's, he's got, Noel has really bad hands, but Mitch's hands aren't great either. Um, we saw the other night in Chicago on Wednesday, not pretty, um, you know, dropping a lot of passes in, in traffic. Um, but yeah, if he gets stronger, you know, if he gets a little stronger, that's going to help him on the glass. That's going to help him finish in traffic. And, um, I think that's it. I, I think he's really done a good job. I don't think he's been the best player on the Knicks this year, but I don't think he's been bad at all. I think he's really showing improvement year to year so far, and this has definitely been the biggest improvement um, as opposed to his rookie to sophomore year jump. Um, his third season is definitely his best. So a B plus slash A minus for Mitch. Um, now we go to C plus B minus um, Alec Burks. You know, not quite as hot as he was in the first handful of games uh, before the injury. He's had some ups, he's had some downs, but 
you know, he still provides you, you know, shooting. He, he's a spacing threat. You know, he spaces out the floor. Teams are going to respect him from three, so they're up on the perimeter, leaving room in the paint when he's on the floor, and that helps R.J. Barrett thrive. Um, Nerlens Noel also gave him a C plus slash B minus. I think, you know, while he does infuriate the fuck out of me at times, um, he does play solid defense. He's, you know, up there in blocks in the NBA. He's got like 1.9 in like 19 minutes a night. So that's cool. He's got zero hands. He's... Again, he's got terrible hands. Um, he's constantly fumbling passes, and that pisses me off. But he makes up for it on the defensive end. Lately, he's been playing really good defense. It was rough for a while, but he's stepped it up defensively lately, and um, you know I'm proud of that. So, um, so C to C plus. I have one guy in the C to C plus range, and that is Kevin Knox the third. Third or the second? I don't know. Kevin Knox. Um, you know, for the first 12 games of the season, he was really playing well. He had eight points a night, and that was in just 22 minutes. Um, but he was shooting 42% from three. He was that corner specialist, that catch-and-shoot gunner, right? That Steve Novak type of presence. Um, since then, eight games where he's averaged just three points in 13 minutes on 31% from three. And the last three games... Um, three DNPs. So, you know, that's kind of the downside of Tom Thibodeau, right? Once uh, a young player starts struggling a little bit, they're pulled and they kind of get booted from the rotation. And Kevin Knox is a prime example of Tom Thibodeau's downside. You know, I would still want Kevin Knox to get minutes over guys like Bullock, guys like Rivers, who haven't exactly been hot either of late. Um, you know, so it's kind of Thib's Tibbs going with the vets over the over the uh, the youth in this scenario here, and I, I still think Kevin Knox has a lot to prove. I don't think he was outstanding to start the year, but he was at least much improved than when he was, you know, a rookie and sophomore. He at least looks credible. Um, I do think he has to do a better job when he's not shooting the ball. He's still pretty one dimensional, you know. Um, I would like to see him create more, take it to the hole. Uh, defensively, he's shown some improvement, but still, I, I I know he's struggled, but man, it's hard to find a rhythm again and regain that flow he had earlier when you're not getting anything more than 13 minutes and sometimes not even playing. Um, so it's interesting. Kevin Knox is in the doghouse at the moment. What's going to happen there, I don't know. But I would play him, man. We just got to play this kid. I don't like how he ice young kids who are struggling. That's one of the things I was really worried about. Um, he's not doing it with everybody. He's just doing it with Knox and you know, maybe Obi a little bit, but that's more understandable because Julius is playing well. But there are positions out there that aren't really achieving well. Again, Bullock, Rivers, and Knox can slide in there. But we're not really playing him right now, so it's frustrating to see. But I did give him a C, C+, because he was playing decently right to a degree when he was in there, uh, relative to where he was earlier in his career. Uh, Austin Rivers, it sucks, because I like this kid a lot. Uh, he's, you know, he's got the attitude for New York. He really wants to do well here. You could tell that. But he's not really playing well. Uh, I give him a D plus, C minus. Is that a little too harsh? Probably, maybe. But he's just not been efficient at all for a while now. Outside of those two Utah games and maybe the one in Cleveland and one more game, he's not done much. He's been very inefficient. A lot of performances where he's under 40%. Um, shots that I was on. He's over dribbling a ton. Kind of messes up the rhythm of the offense a whole lot. Um, I don't love that. A lot of dribbling where he kills the shot clock and kind of just goes out of the way to try and do his own thing, and that frustrates me. Um, so he's not really been that good. And, you know, after those, you know, after that game against Utah the first time, you know, Knicks fans were like, oh man, we got him for a steal. Turns out we're getting exactly what we're paying for. A streaky uh, bench scorer. Um, Reggie Bullock, I gave him a D plus to C minus as well. I, maybe I'm harsh here too. I don't know. The shot's not always on. For a supposed sharp shooter, he's not really a great shooter. He's only 33, 34% um, so far. You know, the defense is okay. He tries hard defensively. He can play the one to three defensively. He can slide up all the way to the, you know, the threes. But. 
I don't think that's enough to justify him starting or at least getting 27 minutes and I, I still think again Kevin Knox should get the lion's share of those minutes um, and then we go to I'm happy I'm in a good mood tonight so I gave Peyton a D to a D minus <laughs> I'm in a good mood or D minus to a D rather is that too harsh? No, I don't think it's too harsh. The guy's been terrible for the Knicks. Um, is that too nice? I don't know. I think he is who he is. Again, he's averaging 12, 4, and 4 in, what, 28, 29 minutes. Um, just 46% from two-point uh, distance and uh, just 25% from three-point land. So not really efficient. You know, and we can't keep using the defense excuse because we've seen him multiple times this year against the... Elite guards, he gets obliterated against decent guards. He, he's not very great either. He's not that good of a defensive player. He's always on their hips. I I just don't think he's been good. How could you shoot 25%, score, you know, sometimes single digits, a lot of the times single digits, and consider yourself a big part of this team? He's not a modernized point guard and the Knicks have a modernized point guard in Emmanuel quickly at the moment I would start him and I think Peyton's grade will be marginally better if he were to come off the bench and did what he's been doing but he's not he's getting almost 30 minutes a night as a starter um, and so I, I think he's played D caliber basketball you know, I don't think he's been... I, I didn't give him an F because you, you can't really give anybody an F when your team is, you know, overachieving at the point guard position, too. So, uh, while I don't think, you know, the Knicks' success has been at the hands of Peyton, yeah, I just... I can't give anybody an F. Um, but, I, I, regardless, a D is a D. It's not a good grade. He's been playing bad basketball. He's a... a below average player this season I believe and for as much as his usage is up there he's got a usage rate north of 20 percent the production the efficiency has not been to that level so yeah I, I'm not a fan of what he's done and I want him gone as soon as we can but I'm sure he's a nice dude blah 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 I, I I'm just I'm not a Peyton guy and you know most Knicks fans aren't for that same reason um and then I've got a bunch of NA guys that I really can't grade because we haven't seen much. Uh, Obi, Frank, DSJ, Taj, Iggy, more. Right uh, with Obi, you know it, it, he's not really impressed me when on the floor. Um, but the Knicks don't really use him the way I would like to see them use him. He's often hovering outside the three-point arc, just shooting. Um, if you stretch his numbers out per 36 minutes, he's jacking up six triples a night, and that's not really what you want from a an athletic big. Right, you want him playing down roll, uh, down low on the roll, right? Um, maybe in the dunker spot, playing him in the post more, uh, shooting, you know, an occasional three-point shot, which he's got. You know, this shot looks pretty good. It's got the high arc, the rainbow arc, and it's been going in a decent clip. But um, we haven't seen much. You know, it's hard. It's tricky. It's very tricky, right? Well, that's that's the issue with drafting talent over fit, right? That's on full display right now because Julius Randle is on fire. He's obviously not going anywhere this year. And Obi Toppin is a rookie under Tom Thibodeau. So he's not going to get the starting role when the vet is really performing well. And uh, I, I get it because the vet isn't like he's 33. Randle is 26 years old, so he's still a young player, relatively. So it's, it's a difficult spot for Obi. And eventually, like I said, the Knicks are going to have to make a decision here whether or not they want to keep him around or f develop him in the future, I don't know. It it's going to be really difficult to figure out what to do here. I really don't know. Uh, but yeah, can't give him a, a real grade yet. Um, so, that said, we went through the roster up and down. Um, let's, you know, Tom Thibodeau, the coaching staff, Kenny Payne, yada yada, the Knicks as an organization, the team. How have they fared this season? I give them a B plus slash A minus. I really think they're playing good. Again, you're 10 and 13, 23 games into the year. If you were to ask me that, if you were to tell me that, you know, before the season started, I would have jumped up and down and would have been thrilled. Especially being that these games have been won, again, by the youth. So, 
that's a huge positive for me. I am very happy to see that the Knicks are not only winning games and being competitive, but they're doing it with the youth, mostly. So I have to give Tom Thibodeau a B plus, A minus. Um, I think he's doing really good. Are there things I would like to see? Of course. Like I said, the point guard situation, got to get Peyton out of there as soon as possible. Um, I think Mitch needs more lobs. I think RJ Barrett at times still needs to be featured more. Um, I believe that, you know, we need... At times, it feels like we don't have much of an offensive scheme other than a couple of DHOs and just let Alfred Payton do what he wants. Um, but I'm not going to go too nitpicky here. Again, the Knicks are in these games because of their defense and because you know young guys like RJ, Randall, and Mitch are playing exceptionally well um, on both ends. So That's it. That's, that's pretty much what we've got. We're about an hour and 15 in, uh, so I, I appreciate you guys stopping by. If you uh, haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, be sure to subscribe to BD4 right now. Just go to my link tree. That'll have all the links to you know all of my outlets, social media, the blog, and the podcast. Um, go to linktr.ee slash rjcarbone. That'll take you to my link tree. All right, so guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Let's get to the NYY NYK question of the day. All right, so, um, shit, man, I really need to get this over. 99.87 with about four minutes left. That's going to come close. I'm going to come really close. Let me check to see if LeBron, oh, no, I already have the assist. Yeah, 80, uh, 99.89. There's only four and a half left. I really need to hit the over here. Damn it. I don't know if I'm going to get it. 201. All right, so in episode 209, uh, the NYYMYK question of the day, which Nick won the sixth man of the year in the 1994-95 season? Um, at the time, I said 95-96 accidentally. It was actually the 94-95 season where a Nick won the sixth man. Uh, but regardless, which Nick won the sixth man of the year in the 1994-95 season? That was the question of the day for episode 209. The answer to that, to the NYYMYK question of the day for episode 209, Anthony Mason won the sixth man of the year. R.I.P. to Mace. Uh, for tonight's NYYMYK question of the day for episode 210 is, which Nick became the first NBA player to make 200 plus three-pointers in a season? All right. If you want to hint, that was in 1995, I believe. All right. So which Nick became the first NBA player to make 200 three-pointers in an NBA season? All right, so message me the answer to that NYY NYK question of the day via Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or you can comment the answer once I publish this podcast. Um, that's it, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Once again, I am your host, RJ Carbone, and this is episode 210 of BD4. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. Thanks for listening to the podcast, or if you're watching the podcast, I appreciate you watching. Um, but that's all we've got for this one. That's all we've got. So once again, guys, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, we are sponsored by Anchor. If you want to start your own podcast, you can go to anchor.fm or download the Anchor app. Plenty of fun, plenty free. Um, but if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, we're on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, many other outlets. To get to those outlets and sub to, to subscribe to them, just go to my website. And to find my website, just go to my link tree, which has... The links to everywhere you need to find me at. Um, so go to linktr.ee slash rjcarbone. Guys, thank you so much. And I'm going to go watch the rest of this game and make sure I can win some money. <laughs> I'll see you guys next time out. All right, ciao.
This podcast is sponsored by Anchor.